my name is Rina Dekter, uh, and I have a host, I am hosting today Yolanda Gill. It's really a great pleasure and an honor to have Yolanda visiting us. Uh, Yolanda uh, and I knew each other for many, many years. Uh, Yolanda is a, a director of the new initiatives in AI and data sciences in USC Viterbi School of Engineering. Uh, and she's also a research pro professor at Computer Science at USC uh, and ISI. She uh, is also director of the data science program of the USC Center for Knowledge Powered Interdisciplinary Data Science. So Yolanda got her uh, master and PhD in Carnegie Mellon. She worked, I think, on planning related uh, stuff. Um, she is currently, her research is on intelligence interfaces of, for knowledge capture and discovery. And she has huge amount of collaborators. Uh, we will hear about it today. She collaborates with scientists in many domains. Uh, on semantic workflows and metadata, uh, capture social knowledge collection, computer mediated collaboration and automated discovery. Yolanda is also a fellow of uh, AAAI or AAAS uh, and uh, IEEE and ACM. And finally, Yolanda was the president of AAAI, the uh, American Association of uh, actually Advancements Association of Artificial Intelligence. It used to be American. The name was changed. And there is an anecdote there that I'll share with you. Uh, Yolanda and I were both candidates for this position, and Yolanda was elected. And uh, later, where, when I saw how Yolanda performed her role, I was really admiring her performance, and I was really happy that it was not me. So let us uh, welcome Yolanda. Thank you, Rina, you're very kind. Um, I have to say that I had a chance to, to collaborate with Rina on research uh, for some time. Uh, we would meet in front of a whiteboard and talk about uh, really hard problems that I was finding in terms of uh, configuring equipment and constraints and so on. And uh, I learned a lot about how to turn you know, amorphous problems in my head into something very clear and very modular and very factorized to be able to find algorithms for it. So I'm very grateful for those discussions. Um, I am thrilled to see so many students in the room. Um, I want to share with you that I started my uh, public research career here at UC Irvine. Uh, I came to a machine learning workshop in 1987 when I was fresh in graduate school and I presented my first paper here. And it was very intimidated to have in the room, um, you know, people like Alan Newell and John Laird and Jeff Hinton and Jaime Carbonell and all the uh, parents of, of machine learning in the room while I was presenting my little piece of work on planning and learning. Uh, it, was, um, it was great. But what I did also was visit the computer science department and it was already really an exciting place. They were uh, talking about creating a, a, a resource with data to promote machine learning research uh, at the time that became the UCI uh, uh, machine learning repository. Also, there was a very visionary project on modeling the world and building a simulator where you could test how objects moved and reacted in the world to one another. Uh, it was called the world modelers. Uh, so think about a lot of the uh, physical simulators that you see built today to develop uh, artificial general intelligence. And, and UCI was already thinking about those things. Uh, they had a lot of cognitive scientists involved in machine learning as well. So, uh, so I have really fond memories of, of my first time at UC Irvine and then when I've come over the years. So thank you for having me. I'm very uh, happy to be here. I want to share with you work that I've been doing the last uh, 10, 15 years uh, on uh, moving towards AI scientists. And when I think of an AI scientist that actually is capable of doing science, it, it's a really, really long-term and hard problem. So I, I want to scope that a little and be a little bit more modest and talk to you about 
AI systems that can write scientific papers? What would that take? And my belief when I read a lot of scientific papers is that a lot of them do pretty routine things. And there's many papers that follow exactly the same method. So if you're doing population genomics, you might use an association statistic to test something or a, a, a PDP statistic. And, and, and you do that for genomics data about cancer and genomics data about something else and genomics data about something else. But the studies look very, very much the same to me. And so, so how can we have AI systems that actually churn through data systematically in many domains and help us advance science? We tend to do a lot of things manually and inefficiently. So, so I want to start to think about what would it take for AI systems to actually take on this task of writing papers. Uh, the work that I do is highly collaborative. So I work with um, uh, researchers in cognitive systems, in high performance computing and machine learning, but also with a lot of scientists in different domains. Uh, when I work in different domains, I learn how to generalize the ideas and the principles, and that's very important. So I'm very grateful to have been uh, given the opportunity to learn from so many people about these these big problems. So. So I want to introduce this concept of AI for science. And what I want to start with is that AI has had many uh, important contributions in terms of uh, intelligence and, and modeling and capturing and, and uh, representing knowledge, uh, reasoning, uh, perception, action, robotics in, in almost all areas over the years. So since I um, uh, graduated in the 90s, I just highlight here some of the things that I've seen that have been very important to me in different areas. So, um, so things like um, agent systems that flew crews of helicopters in the 90s, where the human commanders could not distinguish the human pilots from the AI pilots. To me, that was really surprising and, and exciting. Um, I don't know if you know this, but in the 90s, there was a neural network in a van that drew itself, uh, drove itself um, autonomously throughout the country. And it came here to San Diego from Pittsburgh. It was called an Av Lab. And they came all the way to San Diego. There was a crew that came with it, of course, watching the breaks just in case. And they called the Jay Leno show to say, you know, we have this AI system, this neural network that drove this van through the country. We want to come in your show and tell the country about it. And they were told by the producers that this is not interesting to anybody. You know, you guys are nerds, you know, that's nice but that's not interesting to anybody. So come to today where people are claiming to have the first system that has a neural network that drove across the country. So AI has had incredible contributions in the area of knowledge representation and ontologies. We've been able to connect and integrate so much knowledge in biology through the gene ontology and others, uh, publish general knowledge on the web through RDF, represent and, and convey emotions through AI systems, emotional state and perceive emotions, have teams of robots that collaborate, have um, spoken interfaces, conversational interfaces to AI, machine translation systems. I'm very proud of Wikidata because it is a, a more structured version of Wikipedia that one of my uh, postdocs uh, uh, generated and started at the Wikimedia Foundation. So there's been impact of AI in all of these areas. So I know there's a lot of work at UC Irvine on machine learning and uh, statistics, but I want you to realize that AI has had many advances that have had an impact in the world in, in many other areas. And, and that's how I think of AI. So when I look at AI for science, I, I look very comprehensively at you know, things like um, reasoning and matching and search. I think about different tasks that are important to do when you're uh, reasoning and when you are uh, solving uh, hard problems. So that's my view on AI. AI is transforming science. So if we talk about science in particular, you see a lot of, uh, of course, machine learning over data. I think many of you work in science domains and, and I, I've seen that uh, throughout 
uh, the, the department, um, but also on knowledge technologies where you have uh, a representation of the current state of the art and understanding of protein interactions and then being able to hypothesize uh, uh, things that might be the case based on those interactions or or natural language text extraction, where we can uh, uh, reconstruct properties of, of different um, atoms and molecules. So, so AI is doing a lot to transform science. Um, I want to mention also that uh, maybe it's been less noticed, but there's a lot of uh, ontologies and data on the web about science uh, because of AI. So uh, representing entities in science and being able to describe data with respect to those entities, whether proteins or molecules or anything else. Uh, and there's been several big efforts in this uh, space, uh, including Wikidata, which I mentioned earlier, with a lot of great knowledge about uh, entities. And, and of course, AI has a long history with uh, scientific discovery. So uh, there's been a, a, a great tradition of data-driven scientific discovery in AI. How do we cluster, uh, classify data? But also, how do you uh, infer and hypothesize equations and laws from data, uh, and how do you do that, as well as more cognitive aspects of science, so um, uh, causality and, and uh, uh, paradigm shifts, and, and how does one think about uh, causality in science, so there's also a lot of cognitive analysis for, for science. Um, one thing that I've learned from uh, working in this domain is that we think of scientists as people that do very special thinking, right? And we are in academia, so we are scientists as well in computer science, so we want to uh, think that we are special and we have these special uh, ways to think about uh, hard problems in science. But also as humans, um, what I see is that science suffers sometimes from our inefficiencies and our uh, ways to, to approach problems. So one is that we are not necessarily very systematic. So humans are not necessarily very thorough and systematic when they do a task. So I show you in the first graphic at the top some work from uh, Shannon Peters and others comparing uh, the work that uh, Sepkowski uh, did for 10 years looking at papers and extracting the fossil record from those papers by hand for 10 years, he and his students. And then you see the graph um, in black at the top of how many records and the diversity of those records extracted automatically by an NLP system. I was quite shocked when I saw these results. I knew they were working in this project, but I thought there is no way that text extraction, this is work from 2014, there's no way that text extraction is going to do better than humans actually reading the papers and extracting the record. And in fact, it was significantly more uh, productive at, at extracting knowledge from papers. So humans are not necessarily doing a very systematic uh, job in science. Uh, humans also uh, make uh, mistakes and errors. There's a lot of retractions of papers, uh, and many times unintentional, and I've seen some coming from Nobel Prize winners that retract papers. Um, and the one that I cite here is a student from UMass Amherst who tried to reproduce work from two economists at um, from Harvard and was not able to reproduce it and ask them for the data and then finally look through all the work and uh, they had uh, dropped a lot of uh, the data. They had not seen it because it was below in the screen and, and they just dropped it from their analysis. So, so we make a lot of errors when we do science. That's why it's so important to have transparency in science. Uh, humans, we are also biased. So I cite here work by Liz Bradley and colleagues on um, how to, uh, have an AI system that looks at data and generates plausible hypotheses from that data. And it turns out that this AI system generated more hypotheses than the published papers that had analyzed the same data. And what the scientists responded was, yeah, those are plausible, but I just wanted to highlight the ones that I thought were more interesting or, or uh, they, they preferred those hypotheses for some reason. So we're also adding our biases on how we 
progress uh, in, in science and our, our biggest bias is what we prioritize that we want to work on next. So lots of things are dropped uh, from, the, uh, from the science agenda. And then finally, we do very poor reporting. So it's notoriously difficult to reproduce papers from other people. Uh, it just takes a lot of work. I don't know if any of you have tried to do it. We've done that a lot in my group. So, um, so papers are not written in the most efficient way for others to, to build on. So, so the way that people that we do science is, uh, is really not uh, necessarily ideal. And so I want to really take a look at ourselves and think, you know, maybe it's not just nice that AI can make us more efficient. It's not just nice that AI can contribute to science, but maybe uh, AI can help us be better scientists. Um, so that's my goal with, with all this work. And, um, you know, I look at the big problems that we have in science today, you know, understanding the universe, um, sustaining our environments, or understanding disease or the brain. And, and I just wonder if, if we are prepared to cope with all those errors and biases and, and lack of systematicity and so on. So I'm very eager to bring AI to the science ecosystem to improve things. So I motivated all this from the point of view of can AI write scientific papers? And I just want to uh, point to a, a couple of things from how we write papers today. So we worked with um, uh, Phil Bourne, who uh, um, organized a workshop on how should we write scientific papers and how should we document methods. And for that workshop, he shared with everyone the proposal that he wrote for the work, the methods that he set up, the questions that they set up to answer, the data, the code, the results, the papers, everything about that piece of research. And with all of that information, we tried to reproduce the work in one of the published papers from that work. And so on the left, you see a paragraph that describes what they did. They say that they use the ESMAP software. They uh, looked at binding sites of protein structures and then also homology models, et cetera, et cetera. So we thought, you know, they use this uh, SMAP software uh, and they were comparing the, the ligand binding sites using that software. So that's one step in the process and we thought we just take that software and configure it and, and that's what they did what was really done is that they run the software separately uh, from uh, for the uh, protein structures and from the, for the homology models those were separate runs then they sorted the results then they filtered the results then they combined the results uh, eliminating anything that was not significant under some threshold none of that was described in the paper so when you try to reproduce what the paper says you get results that are very different and unless you're the author or somebody with a methodology or the level of knowledge very close to the author it's very hard to figure out what was really done so, so it took about two months of effort to reproduce the work. This is not unusual. We had to contact the authors. Uh, there's, there's two statisticians um, uh, that call this kind of work forensic research. So it really takes a lot of effort to reproduce work sometimes. There's data from pharmaceutical companies about how they set out to reproduce papers and they cannot. So, um, so it's really, sometimes you give up on, on reproducing other people's work. So one wonders how much we're building on, on each other's work. So one of the things that I've done is uh, I reckon that if papers are better written and contain more information, it will be easier uh, or more possible for AI systems to read them and really understand what was done. And so I've done a lot of work to document what should scientific papers look like in the future. And so looking at best practices, good principles for archiving data, for preserving data, for sharing data, same thing for software, same thing for methods and workflows. And so um, I worked a lot with young scientists in um, geosciences. We had a, a group of about 30 young scientists and we developed principles for the scientific paper of the future. Uh, we have a lot of exemplars of them uh, that caught on in, in uh, neuroimaging. 
uh, also in geophysics. And we have similar principles for AI if you're interested. But it means that there are things that we would like to see in the papers that humans are not generating, including myself sometimes, but uh, we need to do better. And others have worked in this space of how do we capture more information about what a scientific paper is about and the methods that they contain. Yeah, so for example, there's a lot of ideas about nano publications that publish specific pieces of the paper, so micro uh, contributions of the paper. There's also work on research objects that are um, encapsulating particular steps in the process or aspects of the science, including uh, slides, for example, from a presentation. So could AI generate a paper automatically? So what would we need to represent? Uh, you know, maybe all the steps that are involved, maybe more information about the steps um, so that AI can really generate these papers. And I think if we did that, uh, if we had maybe an AI take all the science that we do on the left and generate the text of the paper, it would be a lot more accurate. Uh, the paper could be customizable. So if someone is reading it with a particular interest in the software versions and the libraries that were used, you could relate that to them. Uh, but if someone's more interested in the methodology or the statistical significance, you could emphasize other things there. Um, you could update the paper. You could reuse the methods in the paper. You could ask what if questions, uh, trying different scenarios. You could compare one paper with another, which today takes a lot of work because you have to reproduce both and really look at the differences. But also we could have this AI system try to do uh, novel kind of work. So apply the methods to new data or try creative approaches. What if I change this map software by something else uh, or change the method in other ways? So, so those are kind of the first uh, steps in my mind towards AI being more in the science ecosystem, that AI should understand the knowledge that's involved in doing the science and then um, generating the papers. So we've done some work on, on uh, generating different kinds of text for the paper, the method section of a paper where you're describing, you know, I run this software, I looked at this data, I followed this question, uh, it's kind of more amenable to this, uh, but these are just very tiny pieces of the paper, right? The paper has many other aspects that are much harder to generate. So we have a, a long way ahead. You have a question? Yeah, I was just wondering, so what you're suggesting here, are you suggesting a program that allows you to emphasize whatever you want to put into it, or are you only suggesting something like dynamic where you can like change the article? Both. Both. So I imagine the papers of the future not being static papers that you publish, you get a DOI, and that's it, but that if there's more data available, uh, right, you can get updates of the results. And if something changes significantly, then it's worth noting. Uh, there's, I think there's very few areas where that happens with papers. So I'm suggesting both. Yes, thank you. All right, so, so that's where, where I'd like to go. Any other questions? All right, I hope you think this is an interesting problem, a worthy problem. I want better cures for cancer, very tr better treatments for cancer within my lifetime. I don't want to have to wait 100 or 200 years. And I look at the pace of science, and I'm impatient. I want it to advance more. So I hope that many people in AI will, will take on uh, these questions and these areas. Go ahead. So this sounds like incredibly ambitious. So almost like a science fiction. Uh, so. Uh, do you have any boundaries in what you are trying to do, let's say, in the show here, in terms of eventually you want really to do research from scratch, yes, right? And not only write a paper, but also do the research, right? So what is the, how would you bound this ambition? That's a great question. So I just showed you this example from just the method section of a paper, right? And different ways to narrate how it was done. You can emphasize the software, you can understand, the, you can emphasize the data that you've used and its properties. Um, so the method section of the paper is the most accessible and feasible one. 
even that is hard, but I'll show you examples of where we've done that in genomics, we're working in neuroscience and other areas, um, but the method section is the more feasible. Uh, the related work area is much harder. Uh, there's a lot of people that are extracting facts from papers or the findings of papers and creating networks where they can actually say this paper has this finding, but it relates in this way to these others. So that can be a good starting point to, to generating that section of the paper. Um, I think coming up with the questions is probably the hardest of all the parts of the paper. So what is the question and why? Is that a good question? So, so there's certainly uh, stages to this. There was another question here. Yes. Would it make sense to have AI um, validate or reproduce or check completeness and consistency of a paper rather than generating it? Would that be easier or, or, or useful at all? Yes, so uh, I think that it's easier to generate a paper than to validate somebody else's paper. So um, it's easier to generate than to critique in general, right? It's a much easier task. And I think that's the case with papers as well. Yes, go. Uh, especially when we're talking about the medical research and research in disease, um, we're using people measuring that how does uh, as we move forward that's a very important question. So in, in a lot of research, it's important to uh, be able to detect and avoid and, and uh, deter people from doing any kind of p-hacking or, or be able to pay attention to the characteristics of the data, uh, deal with um, uh, the quality of the data in the first place. So um, there's uh, a lot of people uh, thinking that if you are able to publish publicly your hypothesis before you start the work, then you will be honest about your findings and your findings might be negative. So there's two aspects of this. One is to enable the publication of hypotheses before the work occurs. And the second is to be able to publish negative results if you have them. So, so these are very great questions and these are very complex problems. Um, I hope that you see the value of trying to, to address them. I will tell you some of the work that we've done in this direction. Uh, and what I focus on is that science has many aspects to it. And there's uh, representing physics, representing mathematics, uh, representing biological processes. Those are very hard kinds of knowledge. Uh, and we don't focus on that. We focus more on uh, the, the reasoning and the um, steps that scientists take to, to process data. And I'll give you some example of that. And I think that in this slide, I'm just showing you the range of um, uh, types of knowledge that we focus on. And I'll walk in the talk through each of these aspects um, in turn. What we're trying to do is capture scientific artifacts, scientific structures that are not captured in papers. Uh, and in some instances, we create new scientific knowledge. And I'll, I'll point to that um, because that's something that we do in the process as well. So let me start with science vocabularies and standard ways to develop, uh, to describe scientific data. And this is in the area of, of crowdsource vocabularies for data. So the example is from paleoclimate. Paleoclimatologists study uh, climate from hundreds uh, of years ago. They drill cores in the ground, whether in the ocean, they get uh, coral uh, samples, in the ice, they get ice cores, uh, in lake sediments. So throughout the layers of the of this cylinder, they can see uh, evidence for climate from past uh, times. And so these communities are very different. People that study ocean cores, people that study ice cores, et cetera, they're very, very different. They describe their data differently. But if you're trying to detect trends in climate for the last 2000 years, you really want to pull together all of this data. It takes them uh, about two years to produce a paper that really looks at data worldwide and looks at different sources of evidence. 
But of course, if you're looking at ice cores, you're describing the bubbles of air that is trapped in the ice. You're describing very different things than if you are describing the growth or lack of growth on, on a coral um, uh, sample. So, so they uh, wanted a way to come up with um, a more uh, unified way to describe their data, but they didn't want to take the classical approach of going to a lot of meetings and discussing this for, for many months or years, which is what happens in many areas of science. So, so we proposed to them a new approach where I am describing my data. And when I describe my data, I can use my own vocabulary. And if there's another scientist describing their data, they know I exist. And so they'll look at what terms I used and they might adopt some, but they might have a different idea about what terms they prefer to use themselves. And so we created a framework where we could crowdsource the ways in which every community and every scientist wanted to describe their data as they were describing the data. Typically when you create a, a standard to describe data in science, you get people in a room and you say, okay, how would you like the standard to look like? What terms do you think you should have? It's very abstract. So here we focus very much on the data. So the result of this was one face-to-face -face meeting where they all agreed to use the system to generate the standard. Uh, and a few months later, they had a common way to describe their data that they still use today. And the standards called PACs for paleo climate. So on the left, you see a semantic wiki where they could adopt terms that existed. We used uh, uh, completion to show them what was available. They could browse different terms and they could add their own terms. This is an example of a particular data set that they had. And then on the right, we show you that um, there's uh, standard ways to describe things like location. And so we used a lot of standard ways and well-designed ontologies to describe a number of things in this domain. Um, they also seem to have a standard, pre-existing standard, uh, written in a paper. And we showed them that it was very ambiguous uh, when it's written in natural language. And so as they were describing their data, they discovered that they could not be using the same terms for very different things. So it was a really, uh, interesting exercise in terms of formalizing their thinking, uh, we had a big lift to do from the point of view of AI because here's an initial proposal of terms, here's a bunch of scientists describing their data, adding new terms, so now we have a version that has new terms, but we have to upgrade all the descriptions that we had already, that they had already worked on. So we had uh, this new approach to adapt to uh, ontology updates. And in the end, different communities, whether it was ice cores or trees, I show you a few here, um, came up with their own vocabularies, their own ways to describe their data. And there were a lot of terms that were common. So chronologies means uh, time markers over time. Uh, and a lot of terms that were common to all of them. So this is an example where AI can help scientists create this kind of knowledge that they didn't have before in a very efficient way. Um, and as I said, they, they use it today. Somebody had a question. I'm sorry. Go ahead. How do you do the cross domain ontology? So I, I, I'm not sure that I would call it cross domain. Uh, I have to be careful because all of these scientists work in climate, right? So they have a very common task in the first place and a very common goal. Uh, so when we talk about cross domain and interdisciplinary work, it tends to cross, you know, paleoclimate with historical hydrology, for example, or archaeology. So that that is much harder. But here they had a very common task that made it more uh, tractable. All right, so one of the uh, central pieces is the ability to represent processes, data analysis processes in particular. Uh, so we've done a lot of work on uh, workflows and provenance workflows as multi-step data analysis processes. Um, we've added a lot of constraints to be able to describe that 
this step, this particular algorithm, the parameters have to be in this range and they're constrained by whatever you set the other parameter to. And the type of data that it can uh, take on has to be with these characteristics or the others. And we've separated these workflows from the provenance, the execution, the actual uh, analysis or run that you did, and we can represent both in a very rich way. And so in scientific papers, you often go from one to the other, and we are able to describe to you the general method and you can easily reuse it versus the execution. Uh, we also create abstractions. So uh, step abstraction, this is an example from uh, proteomics. So peptide search engines that there can be several uh, but we can represent an abstract step and, and we have uh, uh, methods to handle different um, arguments or different inputs and outputs for each of the steps. And we can express constraints. So we can say that, for example, in this case, two steps in the workflow need uh, consistent data or consistent properties in the data. Uh, we can express constraints also in the data sets and parameters and so on and so forth. Uh, for all of this, we use um, uh, rules and semantic web technologies and languages. Uh, they're basically uh, frame languages. They have inheritance. You can do inference with their uh, properties and their relation. And then with these constrained rules, you can propagate uh, constraints. And we have specific algorithms to propagate constraints in workflows so that we can tell users when they're inconsistent. Uh, and here's an example of how we use these ideas for uh, time series analysis. On the left is a diagram that a scientist uh, sketched of uh, how to analyze time series data. Each of the steps at the top can be implemented in different ways. There, there are several algorithms for it, and some of them have um, constraints. If you uh, do a step in a certain way, then you have to do another step in, in a consistent way. And so we uh, represent all the steps as an abstract uh, template with abstract steps, but all the step abstractions have specific steps and the constraints that come with them. So uh, we have um, developed algorithms to, to propagate these constraints. So we can start with some time series data set and uh, we'll start to elaborate this workflow and say, okay, this time series has these properties, so these steps cannot be implemented with these algorithms, but these other are candidates, and so we start to propagate those constraints in that way. <clears throat> yeah, go ahead. So um, all the steps that you're describing on the left are done manually? Mm -hmm. So the, in the left is the scientist describing to us the knowledge that they use, then we start to put it into these <clears throat> workflows and logic structures and constraints. And when we start to ask them, but you said that this step is not compatible with that one. So if there's all these incompatibilities, there's time series data that cannot be analyzed. And so they'll start to say, oh yeah, that constraint is not that harsh as I stated it, it's more relaxed. So it's a good instrument for us to elicit the knowledge to, to build these workflows. Um, but we only do that once because once you have the workflow, you can apply it in many contexts. That's the value of it. Okay, uh, another thing that we've done a lot is analyze corpora of these workflows. We had a very large, very rich uh, corpus of workflows in neuroscience where the scientists had done abstractions for steps where they expanded the workflows. So we applied process mining techniques to find common uh, workflow fragments that are used in a whole community of scientists or across many problems. Uh, and this is a very important area. This is also new knowledge to tell them this is commonly the way that people warp an image. That's the most common method across all the, all the scientists. So we're extracting this new knowledge. We've also worked on um, provenance standards, so not just imagining that we can represent the provenance, but pushing a standard at the World Wide Web Consortium uh, where uh, this can describe not just provenance in science, but also other aspects. And so it's been adopted very widely uh, in science, but beyond on the web and, and in companies and so on. So uh, to me, that's also important to do to, to affect uh, how science tools are built. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about science questions. This is a very hard area, but we are also working on 
how to drive analysis from hypotheses. So in other words, I may have many workflows, many methods to run, but what's my task? What's the question that I'm trying to ask? And that's what we're answering uh, here. So we start with an inquiry or a hypothesis or a question, uh, and we follow the scientific method, which is to think about what data would I need to answer this question? Maybe I already have it. Maybe I need to collect it. Maybe there's a repository that has this data, as is often the case, for example, in omics and cancer, for example. Uh, you get the data, you apply your method, and you may be able to analyze different data sets and use different methods. So you have to uh, synthesize all these results and decide what your findings are and then uh, propagate the findings, to, the findings to see what is your next question. So we've automated these uh, pieces. One key idea is uh, creating lines of inquiry that relate questions to queries about the data that's necessary to answer that question. So the example here is for um, looking at uh, proteins associated with a certain type of cancer. Uh, so the line of inquiry triggers everything that you see on the right, uh, and we can refine and revise hypotheses based on the findings. One of the most interesting pieces of work that we're doing is on representing hypotheses, representing questions. We're looking at questions in hydrology and, and groundwater modeling. Um, we're representing not just the statement of the question or the hypothesis, but also the qualifiers, the evidence that we attach to it. And also the, on the top, you see a hypothesis. On the bottom, you see a revision of that hypothesis uh, because uh, when we run the same analysis with new data that was available for uh, colon cancer, it found a new subtype. Uh, so we, we've worked uh, very earnestly on reproducing and being able to apply these methods uh, for a seminal cancer omics papers. And these are just screenshots of a proteomics and a proteogenomics workflow. Um, what we find is that we have abstract steps in the workflow, and there's many methods that different people use. What we found is that key proteins for cancer are found if you use specific methods, but not if you use others. So uh, Mirimatch and Xtandem are examples of, of uh, uh, protein search engines. Um, there's, we use four different engines. Uh, most of the proteins were found by one or the other, but a lot of proteins were only found by three of the four or two of the four. So uh, it means that every paper, when they use a piece of software, they're missing out on a lot of other proteins. Uh, and you see that just changing the search engine is significant, but also on the right, you see that just changing one parameter on the Mirimatch search engine made a huge difference in terms of how many proteins and peptide groups were, were found. So you know, how can we make science more systematic? How can we automatically apply all of these different search engines through our methods? So uh, we did some work with the, uh, what's called the dream challenge, where many people submit entries for the same data. This was a prote proteomics uh, challenge. The method that they follow is sketched in the middle. So we represented it as a workflow. We had many different ways to instantiate the steps. And when you look at all the solutions that were contributed by different groups to the, to the challenge, uh, it turns out that nobody knows why a solution is better and another is not as good. But what we found by generating systematically a lot of different solutions, that uh, gene-specific models give, gave us better results, but any other thing that you change gives you very minor improvement. So there was a, a clear uh, top of all the solutions that we generated that did better and that was reflected in the scores for the challenge that everybody got. So um, the last thing that I'll mention really quickly is work that we've done on uh, integrated modeling. Just because it's such an important problem, um, when you look at uh, food insecurity, we've worked in Ethiopia a lot, uh, droughts or sustainability or uh, flooding. Uh, you have to integrate models from different disciplines. And so you were asking earlier about being able to integrate data from different disciplines. So uh, I've been working in this area for maybe four or five years now, 
And I'm still learning so much about how these models work and how and when they don't work and uh, how to use them better and how to integrate them together. They're very, very different. Agriculture models are more focused on the biology processes. Hydrology models are more focused on the physics. And yet you have to put them together to see how wet the ground will be, how quick your um, uh, plants grow so that you can harvest them before the floods. That's what they are trying to do in Ethiopia, for example. So what we do is represent uh, different models and uh, we represent the formats they use, the variables, the physical variables that they're uh, taking in the input data, what they're generating, the constraints that they have in the types of uh, terrain or the types of um, uh, um, processes that they're running, the parameters that they use. And capturing all of this knowledge, we're able to assist uh, and automate some of these processes. It takes uh, these scientists, if you put a hydrology and agriculture model together, it takes them a couple of years to just sort out through all the different aspects of it. It's a very uh, arduous manual and I would say hardly inefficient process. So we're really trying to reduce that impedance. And, and just to give you an example, this is from uh, a new project that we have looking at fire models. Um, so you want to do a controlled fire in a certain area marked in blue in the middle, and there's many models. So in the left are some of them. It's very hard for someone to really understand wh what model is appropriate. Typically models are def developed by fire scientists, but when I'm trying to do a controlled fire there, I'm a burn manager, I, I don't really know fire science, so I don't know what model is best. So we retrieve data about that particular area. We look at the terrain, we look at the wind conditions. There's many more things to look at, but just to show you that we can say, check my, check my, check my, those three models can be used and we have the data for them, but others with the X, there's reasons why they're not applicable to that area. So, um, we, we're reasoning about these models and enabling, empowering someone to actually run them very efficiently. Um, imagine starting on the left when you don't even know about fire science. You have a question? Yeah. Uh, what is the scope of coming up with some something breakthrough in these uh, methods? Because here, are we just going to mix and match between the existing methodologies or it, can it like? really come up with something really breakthrough. So when you integrate these models together, your predictions are much more accurate and that's the breakthrough, right? So this is an example of a single model because I wanted to show you an example of the constraints. But if you look at it, these hydrology and agriculture model, the hydrology model is gonna tell you the soil moisture in the whole area. When you run an agriculture model with that information, it's so precise that you can really predict but that by mid-February, your crops are grown and ready for harvest, right? If you don't have that, then the agriculture model is saying, let's assume that the soil is medium wet and let's see how that goes, right? So we get much more accurate predictions and it makes a huge difference to the farmers because if you have more time you can plant different crops otherwise you plant the ones that grow faster and you can collect faster and it turns out that in reality the prediction was so imprecise that you had more time to grow something that you can sell for more money right or grow more or more food from it so so it makes a huge difference to be able to integrate the models and and the key is instead of every you know take two years to do that uh, that's an eternity for many reasons, is to be able to do that in a much more efficient way. So these are, I, I don't know if you can imagine, but these are extremely complex models. So these are, we cannot get results in, you know, the, the tempo that it takes to prepare a paper for a conference. These take a long time to really mature and, and uh, you know, be able to have results. So I, I want to spend a few minutes just concluding and reflecting on all this. Uh, I told you about AI scientists that can actually write paper and, and how we've looked at different aspects of science and 
work with scientists to capture knowledge, to, in many cases, create new knowledge. Um, imagine uh, being able to uh, express these kinds of knowledge in different sciences and generating the papers. Um, and that's what we're working towards. Um, science is changing a lot. You see a lot of co-authored papers. Um, a lot of the papers that I see, if they have 10 authors, some of them have graduated, others have left, others are in startups and they cannot talk to you. It's really hard to figure out what was done in a paper uh, as the science grows. Um, this is an example from the Atlas collaboration that led to the discovery of the Higgs bosom. This is their workflow. So every one of the red dots is a task that was executed by some subgroup of people and you see all the information flow throughout it. See how complex science is when you have big questions. It's amazing. And physicists are very unique. They're super organized. They have prioritized, I don't know if you know this, but they have the 10 big questions about physics. They know what they're after. They ask for big equipment, super organized field. Um, but other fields uh, have equally complex problems, but I don't know if they pull together this kind of hero uh, discovery. So, so I think it's worth thinking about that. In science, I think uh, we can learn a lot from, um, from uh, something that's called uh, freestyle chess, where um, players and computers uh, form a team and they play against another team that has any player and any computer. It can be a grandmaster, it can be an apprentice, it can be a supercomputer, or it can be a regular chess program. And uh, Gary Kasparov comments when they've done competitions on freestyle chess, is, he comments that the, the weaker machines, so you don't need a supercomputer, the weaker machines um, and the weaker humans, so people that are not necessarily the best grandmasters in the world, but they have a, a better process, they are superior to just a strong computer and a strong human with a good machine and an inferior process. So the process, who takes what task, what kinds of things can everybody make? And I hope we can devise what are we good at in terms of science and what should we delegate to AI to do? So I think that's our only chance uh, to address these big problems in science. Um, so I think AI systems, uh, this is uh, a slide, I won't get into the details, but I think AI systems also cannot be there just being told what to do by scientists. So scientists cannot just say, okay, take this data, your goal is to classify this, here's how the labels, and here's your metric, and so go. <laughs> Right? So if we build AI systems that just do that, that's very unsatisfactory, right? So I think AI systems need to learn on their own, need to grow their knowledge, need to notice that there's a new software package to do something better. So they, they need to have a lot of ways to explain what they've done, um, connect with people and maybe with other AI. So I think there's a lot of ways in which AI needs to be more thoughtful to be able to really collaborate with scientists. So. So will AI write scientific papers in the future? I think um, uh, we, should, we should be able to answer that question uh, in the next few years. And longer term, you know, reproducing articles and writing articles is a very modest goal. Maybe AI can become a graduate student or a research assistant down the line, uh, and then a co-author, and then you know, eventually an investigator. Uh, my friend uh, Iraqi Kitano proposes that by 2050, AI should be able to win a Nobel Prize. Uh, so, you know, the sky's the limit. Let's, let's dream. And thank you. <laughs> you. I've taken a lot of questions along the way, which is the, the, the best way to take questions, but I'll take more. Yeah. For the model integration, have you ever thought about using the upper common to integrate all of them? Uh, so have we used, have we thought about using upper ontology? So in fact, we have used, um, uh, so upper ontology sometimes have very general concepts about a domain. What we have done is develop principled ontologies that are very systematic. 
So for any physical variable, and this is work by Scott Peckham and others, it's called the standard variable ontology. For every variable that's a physical variable, they look at what, what you're measuring. If you're measuring uh, temperature or oxygen level, where you are measuring, is it a measurement in the canopies, a, a measurement in the ground? Uh, so they're capturing a lot of key properties of how you measure temperature, for example. Usually you would say this model takes temperature, but you don't say what kind of temperature measurement you take. So we have a very systematic way. It's called the uh, standard uh, variables ontology, uh, SVO, if you're interested. Thank you. Thank you. So we took a lot of questions from the talk, so let's thanks for that again. I see a lot of students have class now, so. Thank you very much for your questions. I appreciate them.